So we're going to talk about tonight the root problem of addiction. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the next life, because if you think about it, we're going to spend way more time with God in the, sec in the next life than we are here, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then how can we know God better? And that's really the gist of this whole thing. And our, what's our main goal in life? But just like Trent was saying in, in the songs that he sang tonight, our general theme, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. Just what Mike was saying in his testimony. And why did it take him so long? Why did it take me so long? Because we fight. We don't surrender, you know? We're, we're stubborn. We're selfish. We're self-centered, you know? But he's not. So this is the root problem, right? The root problem of addiction is false worship. Uh, the answer is knowing the Lord. And the better we know the Lord, I think, the more we're willing to worship him. Um, he's the one that deserves, he's the one that deserves it, right? So the... Um, when, you are, when you're struggling with an addiction, it consumes every thought in your mind, you know? And you can't really separate yourself from it. You can't glorify God. You can't even really get to know God that well because you're self-consumed. Um, and I want to try to build the case of worshiping God instead of whatever earthly things that we, we worship. Because it's not about satisfying ourselves. As much as we want to do that, and it comes so natural to us to do that. But that's not what this life's all about. That's not what it's about. It is about serving him. So um, that's the case we're going to build here. Now, um, we're not going to talk about this too much, but I just need to mention it because if you're going to know God, you're going to know Jesus, you're going to know that he hates sin. And sin and addiction can be, addiction is a sin in a sense because it's, it, it, anything that dissatisfies God is a sin. And certainly when we're laboring in that, but we're not going to talk too much about that tonight. But I wanted to note it. But so the new life, right? In heaven, we'll be in the very, very presence of God. We'll be there. We'll be with him. We'll know him, right? It's important to know him now because of what's going to happen later. Um, we will have complete contentment, Knowledge, rest, it's going to be amazing, right? That's our hope. That's what we hope for. That's why we come and read his word. That's why we worship him, right? And we'll worship God every day. But I have to tell you, when I was a new Christian, worshiping God every day didn't seem like it was all that it was cranked up to be. <laughs> You know, like you sit there and you're going to be in heaven. I know heaven's going to be great. I know it's going to be great. But I'm going to have to worship God all day. You know, it's just, and you know why I thought that? Because I'm selfish, number one. But because I didn't know God. I didn't know God as well as I needed to know him. And believe me, every day we can learn more and more and more about him, right? So I'm going to come back to this point because I feel at least now I know God a little better. And I have a great story to finish with. A biblical approach to addiction. Uh, if your addiction, in your addiction, um, you prove that there are things in the world that are more important to you than God. That's what happens. It, I mean, I know we slip into it and all of a sudden we're kind of addicted to whatever it might be, but things are more important than God, right? Um, but we need to change our focus on something other than ourselves. That's the trick. How do we do that? How do we, how do we stop this? This endless need to, for self-satisfaction. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not easy. Um, and then the, the, the change has to begin and end with Jesus. Right? You want to know God? Know Jesus. Jesus is God on, you know, on earth, basically. You know, he was here. He was with us. Um, so let's talk a little bit about knowing God. You know, he's the only being, I don't know if I should call him a being or whatever, he's God, the only one who wants us to know everything about him. Everything. He wants us to, you know why? He has nothing to hide. He's not like me. I got stuff in my life I don't want you, none of you to know about, you know? I wish I didn't, but I do. That's the difference between God and us, you know? 
And, um, but Peter tells us that his divine power has given everything, us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And what does that mean? By his grace, he's provided us with all the things necessary to conquer anything in life that we come up against. Like, in, like as in this case, we're talking about addiction, right? I'm not saying you're, ever, you're not going to get away from sin in general. You are going, we're going to be, we're going to be sinners. We are sinners until we get to the new life. But we can overcome anything that's in our way from worshiping God. He provides all the things we need for a godly life. A godly life is not, a godly life is not stuck in addiction, right? And he called us, you know? Don't ever think that you went to God. Jesus came to you. That's why we're called. We're called. We're pri- we're, it's, a, it's such a great, great, great privilege, you know? And um, so how do we get to know God? What do we have to do to get to know him better, right? Well, there's a bunch of things. Um, he created everything, and, the, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. He created everything, including all of us. Um, we have a conscience, a human heart, a, a mind that he gave us. But the two things that are kind of interwoven here are through his word, right, and through his son. They're the, really the two best ways, at least in my thoughts are, to get to know God is through those two things. His word, Jesus is the great subject in the Bible. He is the main subject, right? God's glory is the end, of the, you know, the end result of everything that's going to happen, God's glory. But those two things, through his word and through his person, um, the heart of Scripture really is God revealing himself to us. And through prayer, right? We're not going to spend too much time on that today, but it's one way. So how do we do this? Let's talk about the things that God created. I'm going to go a little quick because I know we're a little behind. Romans uh, 1, verses 19 and 20. Since what, made, since what may be known about God is plain for them, because God made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have made clearly uh, seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without an excuse. And Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Matt and I were just in Mexico and walking around the complex where we were at this resort. They had all these different displays of flowers and, and just the beauty that God, his, his creativity, unbelievable. It was just amazing, you know. And you're going to see coming up on April 6th is going to be the next full moon. I'm always amazed when I go see a full moon. But this is God's, this is what he did. This is what he created. He created all this stuff, you know? And I just took a picture because there's so many natural, beautiful things in the world uh, that reflect his, his art, artistic uh, qualities and just who he is, the, the greatness of him. Um, through our conscience and our human heart and mind, in Romans we're told, um, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by natural things require, required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. God has implanted his words in our heart. We know what's right and wrong, don't we? I mean, I know when I'm doing stuff wrong, I know, I know it's wrong. The struggle is, can I stop it? <laughs> you know, that's the struggle. But he, he gives us this conscience, right? But here's the thing we're going to talk the most about is his word and about Jesus. In the beginning, this is one of the greatest verses, uh, sections. This is the beginning of John, the Gospel of John. God, John, his main purpose of the Gospel was to prove that Jesus was, in fact, God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Talk about greatness. He made everything. And Jesus was there in the beginning, right? This is why we should worship, one of the reasons why we should worship him. 
And Luke tells us, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them uh, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The first time Jesus is introduced, you know, we, we, we always think that Jesus is in the New Testament, right? Well, Jesus was mentioned in Genesis 3 when he said, um, when uh, Adam and Eve had fallen, and he, he was, God was looking at Satan, and he said, he will crush your head. He's talking about Jesus, right? Chapter 3 of Genesis. We did a study of Genesis in men's group a little while ago, and one of the first things everybody wanted to make clear, the people who were teaching was, you got to be aware of Jesus. He's everywhere in Genesis. He's not only everywhere in Genesis, he's everywhere in the Old Testament, you know? And he is the New Testament in so many different ways, right? So, um, and John, um, John 10, 30 tells us, the Father and I are one. So he is part of the Trinity. John 5, 39 tells us, oh, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you will have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, about him. Can you imagine that? Man, he just, people think Jesus was just like, and he is loving. I'm not saying he's not loving, but he was to the point. He was all about truth and justice as well. So we can get a better understanding of who he is and why we should glorify him through his word, but then also through him. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. It's only by grace that we're, that we're really even here, really. Um, I'll put these two up. Um, John 1.18 tells us, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who himself, who is himself God and is in our closest relationship with the Father has made him known. We know him through, we know God through Jesus, right? I'm going to go into Hebrews 1 in a little bit, so I'm going to kind of skip that right here. But I hope I'm building the case about how great God is and how anything else we worship is not that great. I mean, so many times I, at the end of a song at a concert, I'm like, hey, 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 it's a great song, you know? And if, but, you know, I never done, I really don't do that for God, and I, I shame myself, but he, does, he is the one. He is the one. We talk about prayer in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit, which, which is within us, um, itself intercedes us uh, through wordless groans. So we if you ever wonder about prayer, and uh, just meditate on God's, the thought of God, and he'll help you. He'll help you through it. But let's, so a couple points to remember on what we've covered so far. God is holy above all things, and we're not. We're just not. I mean, every day, every day. Um, if God did not disapprove of our behavior, he wouldn't have had to go to the cross, right? The whole reason for the cross is for us. Don't you ever sit there and wonder sometimes, like, oh, gosh, you know, especially when I think some bad stuff, you know, and I just shake my head and I go, there I go again, there I go again. Unworthy, unworthy. But the main goal in our life, somehow God has to become bigger than our own desires. So big that we worship him alone. And that's a lot easier to put up on a slide and me verbalizing that than it actually is to do. But remember what the th uh, verse from Peter. And also, remember this. I don't know if you can see this, but these, the, there's nine graphs there, and they represent the fruits of the Spirit. We are, when we accept Christ as our Savior, the Spirit comes within us, we have, I don't know, maybe an, advance, an advantage in all these different areas, you know, like love, joy, peace, forbearance, all the way through. And notice the last one, the one furthest on your right, that one's self-control. We get these things. These are things that are here to help us. They're here to help us for so many different things, but they're also here to help us to live a life that's more worthy of God. So we do have some tools. We do have some ammunition. We have a lot of the world against us. We know that. We have a lot of things that are, you know, con that, you know are against God, but we do have some internal tools. Now, I talked about this. Now, this is only three verses in Hebrews, and I'm going to go through them pretty quick because this, this is how great Jesus is. Uh, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, 
at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he was spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir to all things, and through whom also he made the universe, the son of the radiance. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The exact, rep- he is him, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And he has provided purification for sins. That's where we come in. He sat down at the right hand uh, of the majesty in heaven. So, let's see what he is. He's greater than all the prophets, right? He's heir to all things, right? He is the one who made the universe. This is mind-boggling because of how big the universe is, and you can't even understand it. But let's take a look. That's a picture of the universe. I don't know. That's what I found on the internet. But that's, that's the universe, right? Well, Light travels at 100, I'm sorry, light travels at 671 miles a minute. No, an hour, I'm sorry, 671 million miles an hour. So think of that, million miles an hour, that's how fast light is, right? The furthest galaxy from us is 13.2 billion light years away from us. I just, I mean, you can't... Light travels at 16 billion miles um, a day. And the, the universe, he made that. I get excited when I make a good dinner, you know? I mean, you know? So does Natalie, by the way, but I don't want to get into that right now. Um, 13.2 billion, billion miles away. And they, there might be something beyond that. We don't know. That's how great God is. He made it, right? Um, he's holy. He's... He's the radi- he is the glory. He's not just a reflection of God. He is God. He's the sustainer of all things. I think a couple weeks ago, Jace or Jeff was talking about it in one of the sermons. If God wasn't there, if Jesus wasn't there, things would go awry. Things would just blow out of the proportion. You know, we, we'd, be, we'd be dead, basically, right? He's the sustainer of all things. He's the one who provides the purification of our sins, the sins that we do every day. Every day, just about every day, I get so disappointed with myself. Not as much as what I'm doing or whatever, but, man, I can think of some really weird stuff, you know? And, and, and then I go, back, I go back to the foot of the cross because that's why he died. He knows the, that's who we all. That's who we are. I don't like to admit it, but that's who we are. Um, but that's how great he is. At the right hand of God, actively ruling in our favor, he's there helping us. This is why it has to become more of him and less of me. More of him, less of me. Hard to do, right? Kenny, you should write a song about that. Trent, write a song about that. Um, Jesus is holy. We're not. We're sinners, right? Um, Yeah, the sin is really, uh, it's it's tough, you know? Uh, But we'll get through it. But here's the great thing. Now, I think... um, Pastor Nick sings a song, it's called In Between, who is, uh, right? and that's sort of what this is. The, only the cross can speak simultaneously about holy justice and holy love. Only the cross. There's no other place this happens. That song in between is kind of a little bit like this, you know, because he is all just. Somebody had to pay for our sins. It, had, it could only be, really, it could only be him, and he did it. He decided to do it, and he did it. And he did it because he loves us, you know? This slide alone is really enough to worship him above anything else ever, you know? Um, but he's the center of history. Next time you write a check, you know, remember the date? That's all because of Jesus, you know? Um, it was God's plan to glorify himself through his son. That's the plan from, from the beginning. He's the bread of life, John tells us. He is uh, the gate. Uh, whoever, you have to go through him to get to, to heaven. Uh, he's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He's the vine. Apart from him, he can do nothing. He's talking spiritually there. And then he can read Ephesians there as well. I got a couple more slides, so I, I'm running out of time a little bit. But I hope I'm building the case of how wonderful he is and how, and how we're just so disoriented sometimes that we don't focus. On, I mean, I, we all do it. I'm not, not just me. We, don't, we all do it. And we, we really shouldn't, you know? And this is the thing that um, we, sh- we need to do, too. 
You need to bring doctrine into your life. Doctrine teaches us how to live, right? Doctrine and life are impossible to separate if you're a believer. Because what do we get our clues from? Our nature is one way, but the rearranging of our mind, uh, for there is one God and one one mediator, no, I'm sorry, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, right? That's what we have to do. We can, we can no longer conform. The, the things that come so natural to us, the doctrine tells us that a lot of that stuff's not good. That's not what God wants, Right? Uh, The uh, principles to living are always tied to God's word. And this guy, uh, John, I don't know who this guy is, but it was a nice quote. Holiness is nothing but the implanting, writing, and realization of the gospel in our lives. If you could incorporate all things in this book into our lives, you'd be doing pretty darn good. Pretty happy, too, I would bet. And so what are some of the things? The principles of living, this is who Jesus is. This is the stuff that we're trying to emulate. You know, he's humble. He's gentle. He's patient. He speaks truth. Man, that that alone, boy, we could use a little more of that, can we? We could use a lot more of that. Uh, You know, we don't want to be, even though Jesus got angry at times, but not his rightful anger, justified anger. Be kind to one another. All these different things are are, um, principles for us to be living a life worthy that God called us for, right? So here we are. We all started off on the left-hand side of this chart. You know, we were non-believers, everybody in this room. That's one thing we shared in common, right? Some of us may be in that second part. It's part of our life right now, right? Which is good, you know, getting there. We call that a cultural Christian in the Berean Bible. And then if you're on the far side, we call that a biblical Christian. That's where, that's where Jesus is part of your life. That's where he is your life. That's where you, he, he is now, he's now the priority, It's not whatever you were doing before. He is now the priority, you know? And um, it's a wonderful place to get to. It's a wonderful place to get to. But it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. So if you're not quite there, you just keep reading, keep praying, keep interacting with others. That's how we grow. Um, Before the world began, this is the other thing that just blows your mind. Before the world was even universe put in existence, he knew us. Now think of that. He knew us. He foreknew us. He predestined us. In other words, in our life, he's put things in our life to help us, to help us to grow, right? He called us. He's the one who brought us to him. We didn't go to him. He came to us. He called us. Are we worthy of that calling? Probably no, but... Hopefully we can get a little better each day. And then he glorifies us. And that's where we're going to end up. We're going to end up glorified, all right? Which is the great hope. Um, So let's talk a little bit about enjoying God. You know, when I was growing up, I was in the Catholic church. Kathy, don't take offense at us, no. (laughs) But I always kind of had a feeling that God was like a taskmaster, you know, like a taskmaster. Well, he's not. I mean, he has his rules, he has his things he wants us to do, but he's also, he's completely loving it. That's the word they use to describe that. It's love, right? So he created all things. So let's enjoy him because he knows he, he created all things, he knows all things, and he's everywhere. He loves you more than you love yourself. And I know some of you love yourself an awful lot. I'm only kidding. <laughs> only kidding. <laughs> Kenny at least got that one in. Uh, <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Um, he demonstrated that love on the cross. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine what he did? Really, really think of it. Unbel- amazing. He wants to spend eternity with us. This life is like a blink of an eye. The next one's not going to be. It's going to be forever. Uh, you understand that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. If you read the Bible a lot and you read about God, everything is for his glory. Everything is for his glory. He created us for his glory. And that's where I was having trouble when I was a younger Christian, and we're going to get into that a little bit. But let's not forget this. God is most glorified in us 
when we're most satisfied with him. And what that means is no matter what situation you're in in your life, no matter what you're going through, you know, you need to be satisfied with God because God's good and God's loving. It may, may not seem that clear to you at that point, but he is, right? He's most satisfied with us when we're most glorified in him. And we're going to all go through trials. So we're going to talk about how I changed my mind about worshiping God all the time, you know? Um, this is the uh, revelation. Since we're getting low on time, I'm going to go through it. But anyway, this is where um, the, and John talks about heaven and how we're going to glorify God and praise God. You can read those in a, uh, uh, a little later. But that's what these verses are about. It's, All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. And, they, you know, it goes on from there. But worship God, you know, the thing I was having trouble with. Amen. Praise and glory, the wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever. It's, it's eternity up there, right? So we started with this slide. Heaven's going to be great, but we're, and we're going to worship God all day. So how did I ever get to the point where I can't wait now to go worship God every day, right? Well, it's all about knowing God. Once again, God's most glorified in us and we're most satisfied with him. God is loving when he seeks to exalt his glory in my life. And you might say, boy, that sounds self-serving, but let me read it one more time. God is loving when he seeks to exalt his glory in my life, for that would mean that he would seek to maximize my satisfaction in him, since he is most glorified when I'm most satisfied with him. You've heard the term vicious cycle, which happens in life, vicious cycle. Well, I kind of call this an enduring cycle. This is an enduring cycle, you know? God is loving when we, he seeks our, our worship. And, and just to make it a little clearer, a real quick illustration. Um, it's our anniversary, me and Natalie, right? So it's our anniversary, and I say to Natalie, I say, I'm going to take you out to dinner because it's our 44th anniversary, and spending the night with you to celebrate our anniversary would make me really, really happy. Now, truth be told, I've really never said that, but no, 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 no. But um, <laughs> it would make me very, very happy, right? I don't think now he's going to say, no, I don't want to go out to dinner just because it's going to make you happy. No, it's because I love her and because of our marriage and we're celebrating our marriage, she's going to say, yeah. And then... Um, why? Because if I pursue my full satisfaction in my wife, she is honored. So it is with God. If we are drawn to God because we want to spend time with God, if God is our treasure, our satisfaction, God is honored. God is honored. So that's what that whole kind of thing is. Um, you know, he wants, he's going to be glorified. Whether you, you decide to do it or not, he's going to be glorified. You might as well do it because you're going to get great satisfaction out of doing it, right? And God's pursuit of his own glory is not at odds with our joy. In fact, Psalm 66 says, shout for the joy to God all the earth. So, our takeaway. God made everything. We haven't even talked about this too much, but he's everywhere. He's, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. There's no place he's not, Right? He's omnipotent. He has unlimited power. He can do anything you can imagine he can do. And he's omniscience. He knows everything. He knows what you're thinking right now. He knows what you did two days ago. He knows we're going to, he knows we're going to do on the way home. He knows everything. You know? So I hope I was able to at least build a case on how great God is and how we should worship him. But you know what the greatest thing about God is? The greatest thing. He loves us with all that power, with all that greatness, with all the glory, with all everything he has. He loves us, and that's unbelievable and undeserved. 